Hello, old friends. This is Mike Dawson, and I welcome you to the Silent Pianist podcast, where I interview curious people that do extraordinary things. Today's guest is filmmaker scientist Kyle Sullivan. Kyle is the grand prize winner of the Oceanwide Expedition 2017 Antarctic Contest. As the grand prize winner, Kyle was awarded a 30 day Oceanwide Expedition voyage to the Ross Shelf and Antarctica. The incredible journey gave Kyle an unprecedented opportunity to film and photograph in Antarctica. The result of this oceanwide expedition is this film documentary, Adventures in the Southland, and has episodes available online. Kyle also produces the hugely popular YouTube show, Trexpertise, which explores modern and classical civilization through the lens of Star Trek and science fiction. In 2017, Kyle, along with his wife, Katie Boyer, launched their film production company, Screen Door Pictures. I talked to Kyle Sullivan via his production studio in Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, wow. Well, I don't know what happened, but I just, I killed you for just a second. I think I'm recording you now, so. <laughs> Jeez, man. I touch something and it just like smokes it. All right. That's pretty, pretty fantastic. But I think everything's working. I'm going to formally uh, call this a, uh, our first uh, remote uh, podcast. So Kyle Sullivan, welcome to The Silent Pianist. Hello. And Kyle, if I remember right, you and I met because of Penny for NASA. And uh, that was a long time ago. It was a couple of years back now, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Did, did you did you uh, get involved with that because of a relationship with uh, uh John Zeller? Did you did you know him or was uh, it something that you were just interested in because it was a good cause and you felt this was worth supporting? Um, I was interested in it because it was a good cause. Uh, NASA is always a good cause. Um, I didn't know John Zeller, uh, except I met him through that. Um, I had helped out on a previous online activism thing for the Save the James Webb Telescope. And uh, I think John Zeller reached out to that group uh, looking to connect with folks, and that's how I got scooped up. Okay, and were you just helping him just with uh, just kind of a jack of all trades, all kinds of things to help out because he had everything was a volunteer organization? Were you doing something specific uh, to support the Penny for NASA? Um, I helped do some organizational stuff. I did a lot of graphics and social media management, and uh, we recruited a small team of people, a really good team of people. I'm mostly still friends with, I think, all those folks online, and uh, just, you know, created schedules and had people plug in at particular times, and I don't know what you'd call that, really, social media management, I guess. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing that I did, you know, when I created a couple of films for him, that was the first time I'd ever did anything like that. Hmm. I was uh, very green in terms of, you know, kind of managing a film project as opposed to what I was more skillful at, which was just simply uh, making uh, uh, recordings and things of that nature. It was a pretty good project. Uh, I mean, life sort of intervened and prevented much of us f from volunteering, but um, I don't know. I kind of wish it was still a big force online right now. Yeah, I think what what I found was, yeah, as you say, life intervenes and, and you want to support everything fully. And if if you're like me, Kyle, it's like we do so many different things to support uh, causes and organizations. And there's only only so many hours in the day 
that you can kind of give things away for free because you do have to, you know, do what we all do, which is to make our passions uh, 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 make money for us, whether mm-hmm. it's in film or music. Mm-hmm. But yeah, man, you know, the reason I reached out to you uh, because I was so fascinated with your uh, uh, story as as a filmmaker because your films and the things that you've uh, uh, shown the world online are very diverse. And since we were talking a few moments ago about probably the most important uh, breakthrough for you probably in your uh, uh, career is this uh, trip to Antarctica and uh, your adventures in the Southland. And I don't know where to begin, but tell me how you learned about ocean-wide expeditions and how you were able to uh, participate in the contest. How did you hear about that? Uh, It was really simple. You know, I'd been thinking about Antarctica for years and years and years and uh, got a little bit of wind in the Antarctica sail, so to speak, and Googled, you know, do people really just visit? And uh, one of the first things that popped up was Oceanwide's competition. They have an annual contest every year where they uh, encourage people to sign up and win a complete trip to a a very remote part of Antarctica or or maybe even trips to the North Pole and, and, and areas like that. They specialize in polar uh, travel and uh, they, their big giant Ross Sea trip, which is something they do every four or five years, was uh, the contest that I that popped up in my Google search. And you know, I just decided, why not? There's no way in hell I'd win. Shoot, I'll enter it and not even tell my wife. I mean, who you know, what was I thinking? <laughs> well, and and then you win the thing, but it looks like there was a lot of preparation. Just to make your uh, your uh, application uh, stand out, because I don't know how many people actually tried to get that. It looked like a real bucket list kind of thing, where people would, you know, maybe save, you know, a life savings to do that uh, uh, that type of a trip. What the the value of that first prize was like twenty five grand, right? Because that's what it would probably cost for you or me just as civilians to go to Antarctica and, and be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and being a kind of tourist venture, uh, there are different tiers of, uh, uh, the decks have different prices, the, the rooms, the cabins, they have different prices, uh, attached to them. So some of those slots would cost up to 50 grand easy. Uh, but yeah, the trip was like $25,000. There's no way no way I'd be able to do something like that so frivolously if I hadn't won. So it was really kind of an opportunity uh, of, a, of an entire lifetime, to be honest. Uh, absolutely. I, I was, uh, well, I have been looking at so many of uh, the uh, different uh, film clips that you've been posting and sharing with the world. And uh, like I said, it's hard for me to begin uh, my, uh, my journey with you about what kinds of... Uh, experiences uh you uh, had when you were uh on that journey but if i remember right you had to go to new zealand the bluff new zealand mm-hmm. now um that was campbell island right uh we flew into new zealand's main south island and hung around for a week and then we left f- from a city at the bottom of new zealand called uh, bluff which is near invercargill which is kind of the big town down there uh, and took two to three days to sail to one of New Zealand's five sub-Antarctic islands, right? So they have five islands down there that are basically uninhabited um, that New Zealand wound up in possession of after all the colonial stuff was settled. And uh, Campbell Island is the southernmost point of New Zealand land, and it's basically a preserve at this point. Um, but yeah, it's like two to three days sailing south of uh, the main South Island of New Zealand. And once you were, uh, uh, once you uh, uh, embarked onto uh, the uh, particular uh, ocean vessel, now that was an icebreaker, I assume. It was not, actually. Uh, but oh, it, wow. Um, it was, the hull is specialized. It's uh, 
reinforced for ice travel. So it wasn't an icebreaker at all. Uh, but we did, well, I mean, it wasn't an icebreaker class ship, but we did, the captain did uh, at some point actually break some ice with it. And boy, let me tell you, that was fun. Because <laughs> it kind of smashes down on it. We have this vision that it cuts yeah. through the ice. But it's the weight of the vessel that's kind of like crushing the ice as you uh, make your way through these ice flows and things of that nature. Exactly, yeah. I I learned that the day of the breaking of the ice in the Ross Sea. Like, oh, this is how it works. You just throw your weight on the ice and hope it works. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, man. Yeah. That that must have been like a a first uh, wow moment, you know. But I'm sure every day was every moment of every day was full of wow moments. But so I'm looking at, you know, the, the map that was posted at the, the <clears throat> expedition website and you really made a journey, man. You were across the uh, international date line. You went through uh, uh, places like Cape Evans and Cape Royds and Peter first Island. It's just so fascinating. But was there any one particular uh, uh, any any particular uh, image in your mind that just completely makes it iconic for the whole trip, or maybe it's very hard to choose. I don't know. <sighs> Let's see. <clears throat> it is really tough to choose. There was a lot of really kind of special, unique places down there. But if I had to pick one place. Um, it would be Franklin Island, right? So um, I don't know how many days into Antarctica this was. It was probably the third or fourth day after we arrived. Um, but there was a, an island we went to uh, called Franklin Island. It's a, a penguin rookery. A lot of Adelie penguins and occasional emperors hang out there, race chicks. Well, not the emperors, but the, the Adelies. And there's seals everywhere. And so we had to Zodiac like two miles across open water to get to the island. Uh, they couldn't get the ship any closer than that. And the water was rocky, and there's like this real low bank of clouds. It's really heavily overcast and just dark in the middle of the day, kind of overcast. And uh, the penguin rookery, which is normally thousands strong, it's in late summer, uh, moving into fall, so most of the chicks had already, you know, f- acquired their adult feathers and moved out into the ocean. So, like, you just have the stragglers left, which you know, there's, you know, two thousand individuals maybe hanging around. So it's you're not stepping on penguins walking around, but it's comfortable enough, and there's plenty of wildlife that you can check out. And so, like, this was the first time uh, that I had gotten ashore with the with this many animals in one place, and there's a giant bank of ice uh, swooping up from the beach, like immediately up from the beach. Uh, so like these giant ice cliffs, these low-hanging clouds. There's a deli penguins everywhere. There's an emperor penguin on the beach. It was the closest I ever got to an emperor penguin the entire trip, and we did we did see a lot of emperors. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we, we went to several penguin rookeries. We saw lots of crazy things, but for the first real introduction to 100% pure Antarctica, uh, Franklin Island probably stands out as a very special place for me personally. And probably for most of the people on the ship, it, it was a similar experience for everybody. It was just, you, you, you saw everyone walking around the beach, going different places, using their cameras and looking around, and everybody was really hush. It was like being at a church because like it was so magnificent. And like, you know, you'd walk past someone and they're going to go take a picture of this penguin and you're headed down to the seal and, you know, you just sort of smiled like children at each other and didn't even say anything. You're just like, I can't believe this is happening. It was a really, really surreal experience. That, that clearly is a life-changing experience. And it, it was 30 days. And so you just probably had uh, just one moment like that after another because every, every new uh, environment was probably just as uh, uh, awe-inspiring. And, you know, you, you're really doing what I've seen so far is just such a great job of, of documenting it. I, I thought your photography, your cinematography and your photography is gorgeous, man. You took some really, really nice gear and you took a lot of care to uh, document. I mean, it, it was probably foremost in your mind was to 
be this uh, 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 journalist uh, document documentary uh, filmmaker at all times. You probably never really turn that part of your brain off. And you know, one of the one of the postcard vids that I thought was just gorgeous was one of the ones I watched last night, which was uh, uh, McMurdo Sound. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, yeah. And so tell me about that particular uh, uh, day. Okay, so McMurdo Sound is near McMurdo Station. Um, it is probably the most southern point we went to uh, on the whole trip. Uh, the closest to the South Pole. It was like 77 degrees south, I think. Um, and this place is... It was noted since it was first explored um, as being a very wild wild place. Uh, lots of seals, lots of birds, uh, lots of orcas. There's a, a subspecies of orca that lives pretty much just in the Ross Sea area. And so um, being the end of summer, uh, the days are particularly still long, but they're starting to get shorter. Um, the It had been overcast for a couple of days, and when we pulled up into the sound for the first time, that... Uh, afternoon the cloud bank started to roll back we could see some of the blue sky and the sun suddenly popped out and it was a very strong sun and it started to set normally um sunsets last i don't know 20 minutes you know up here in the the regular parts of the world but that sunset lasted for four six hours something like that uh, all the wild oranges and yellows you get with a sunset. It was just like a sunset in absolute slow motion. And uh, with the cloud bank rolling back, you know, you got to see some of those colors splash off the mountains and off the off the water. And at the same time, uh, you had orcas uh, everywhere. I, I didn't get good footage of the orcas because the ship was moving, and it's hard to get a good shot of a whale uh, when, when the ship is bouncing around. But there are like 100, 150 orca whales all around the ship, all around the ice edge. We're up uh, to the edge of the permanent ice in, at the top of the sea. Uh, and they're frolicking and hunting and socializing with each other. And to see that many top predators in an environment like readily visible to the eye, it really gives you a sense of the health of the ecosystem as a whole. It, I mean, the water must have been absolutely teeming with, with Antarctic toothfish and other prey that the orca normally eat. There were emperors, there were dozens of emperor Dozens of emperor penguins sitting on the uh, the ice edge watching the ship uh, go back and forth. And uh, hold on a second, sorry. Yeah, dozens of sh uh, emperor penguins everywhere. And so, like, we got to see all this splendor uh, f for hours and hours and hours. It was such an exciting, such uh, a colorful vista that the whole ship was out on the deck with cameras. People exhausted their batteries and memory cards. <laughs> Uh, shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, myself included. I, I spent three batteries in a row just shooting and shooting and shooting. And it was a just a, an incredible otherworldly thing. You think Antarctica is going to be like a cold, desolate place, but I, I've, I've honestly never seen so much wildlife in one place anywhere else I've been on the planet. Yeah, man. It sounds like we have no idea. You even use the word yourself. Then Antarctica is your lunar sea of tranquility. I love that from your uh, your little uh, application that you uh, wrote up for the for the ocean wide expedition cruise. And I think that what you just said really encapsulates that because it's it might as well be uh, a moon around Saturn because it is such a unique place in the world and i don't think people get it at all no. and of course you 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 witnessed it and it clearly transformed your entire uh world view in the in those uh uh hours and days uh as you traveled uh from one uh amazing location to another one of the things that i wanted to ask you um and it kind of relates to something uh that you allude to a lot in your films, which is that you have a, a component of uh, history to everything you do, whether you produce uh, 
films about uh, your Antarctic expedition or when you gleefully uh, delve into uh, science fiction. Uh, what, where did that interest come from of history and anthropology and archaeology? Is that something you studied in school or is it just something that you just love and you just consume it because it's a passion? Uh, uh, both. I, I have an anthropology degree uh, from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, I, I love reading history. For me, the, the root of all the different film and video things that I do is the same. It's kind of an exploration of the planet, and uh, science fiction has the same impulse to it that, you know, reading history of scope does, uh, that understanding an ecosystem does. Like, the, the, the perspective from which you're looking down on your subject matter is the same, unlike a, uh, like a, unlike a drama, uh, a film about a drama or a couple or a marriage or something like that, which are, you know, I love doing stuff like that too, but... For me, the rules are the same. It's kind of about exploring the world. Uh, and so like anything science fiction that we do, which my wife and I, that's uh, the kind of stuff we're looking to do in the future, or, or history or language or anthropology, it, it literally all comes from the same place of just child, childlike curiosity. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an easy comfort zone for me to be in. So it's easy for me to produce videos you know, from that root. I don't have to think too hard about it. Just do the research, you know. Yeah, I, I totally have a, a, a similar fascination with it, with those uh, 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 subjects and uh, uh, literary uh, uh, interests. Was your mom and dad also interested in, in those things? Was that something that, that surrounded you as you were growing up? Or was this something more on your own that you kind of developed? Um, well, my dad wasn't around, but my mom was sort of interested in it, I guess. Uh, she encouraged us to read a lot, um, kept a lot of uh, things of that nature in the house for us to consume, and it, it had an impact, you know? And then Indiana Jones came along, and I was like, I really, really dig, <laughs> dig archaeology. Yeah. And then I went, and then that passion sort of, you know, came into its own. I started doing my own reading and, and all that kind of jazz, and eventually I realized Indiana Jones was a terrible archaeologist and kind of a bad person and left that alone. But... Um, you know, it went into school and uh, it, it hasn't left, and I'm still, it still hasn't gone away, gone away. I guess that that means something. Absolutely. So, what's your mom's name? Uh, her name is Maggie. Okay. And Kyle, did you grow up in Alabama? I did. Uh, born in Baltimore, uh, raised in Alabama. Um, yeah. Uh, as you said that, I was thinking of the Steve Martin line, uh, uh, "Born in Babylonia." <laughs> uh, so, you know, so when you were uh, uh, growing up, were you always uh, uh, somebody that loved movies and films, or was that something that came later? Um, both, actually. I let's see. Hmm. I like any kid of the 20th century was influenced by movies and didn't realize it um we had i was the kid uh who would build a stack of vcrs and connect them all together to make recordings and duplicates and stuff like that i'd, I'd work through camera technology and vcr technology that i had at my disposal which was very modest uh i got a hold of a vcr or a, a camcorder actually and i would end up you know going in the backyard with friends and making short dumb movies but uh i'd figured out the language of it pretty early like inserting sound effects and, 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 and things like that. It was crude, uh, but I was doing it just because naturally I just had a, a desire to see a finished product that, you know, was cinema-like. But, you know, I had no interest. Uh, I went to school to be a scientist. I, was, I, went, I, I spent years studying uh, to be uh, an exobiologist. That was my end goal. And it wasn't only, it was just a, you know, four or five years ago that I thought, you know, I really like this film thing, just, you know, 2% more. And I could probably get some of the same mileage out of exploring the planet and the ideas of of the sciences through that medium and probably much better suited to my, my personality. And it turns out I was right. So, like, I just never noticed that I liked film enough to make any until very recently. I was always going to be a scientist. Oh, wow. Very cool. So was there... 
or maybe rephrase this, are there particular directors that you uh, find uh, as role models, uh, or do you just dig it all and uh, and you don't have any particular preference or, oh, oh, or no. love of a particular director? Oh no, <laughs> Every, everybody who picks up a camera seriously has a, a suite of directors that they idolize. I've got a couple. Um, you know, I, I love Martin Scorsese's uh, work, body of work generally. I, I'm a huge fan of Edgar Wright. I uh, just saw his uh, new movie Baby Driver not too long ago, and it was beautiful. It was really crazy fun. Um, uh, it just depends. Jeff Nichols is a really, I really love watching his stuff. He did a movie called Midnight Special recently. Um, I heard rumors he's planning on uh, being a director in the Alien Nation remake, which sounds interesting. Um but it just depends, you know. They're Terrence Malick. I, I love the Terrence Malick film um, about Jamestown. What's the name of that movie? I forget the name of the movie, but I, I watched that almost a year ago. Yeah, that's one I want to go see uh, myself is that one because that's such a fascinating story, um, you mm. know, uh, of, uh, you know, kind of like the the the, the infancy of, uh, of, of the uh, European exploration of North America. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there certain cinematographers that you're drawn to? Uh, oh, maybe it's related to the directors and that's that director cinematographer relationship. Are there people that you like uh, on their own or maybe it's partners with particular directors? Um, it, it, it really depends on the work, I guess. Um, some, some people are just at the top of their game. Uh, let's see. I don't know. I can't think of any right off hand. The, there was a uh, the guy who did some of the Coen Brothers movies. Uh, what's his name? Oh, I forget his name. Uh, Coen Brothers. Top of his game, I think he's a British guy. Uh, everyone, everyone really, really loves his work. Well, you know, sometimes you know maybe that's the best compliment we can give a cinematographer because the, Roger they, Deakins. That's his name. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's. There's well, what I was thinking of is that sometimes, you know, when you when you kind of forget the individual's name, it's because you're so immersed into the beauty of their work, you sometimes forget that there's a person behind it. It's like looking at a beautiful painting, and you sometimes forget who it was that created that work of art. But uh, sometimes, I, 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 but it's, yeah, I, it's I, more I, like I just have a forgetful. Like I forget people's names constantly. I'm really terrible with names. <laughs> Yes, uh, and and your name is Sir uh, Bile. Yeah, Bonham. Edward. Um, <laughs> exactly. So you know, yeah. uh, was there some mentors that you had when you were studying to be a scientist? Uh, particular professors, maybe uh, that really helped you. Maybe find your find yourself as uh, maybe more of a filmmaker that they can encourage you to to go that path instead. Uh, is, uh, is science scientist influencers, Doctor. Well, Edward Wilson, yeah. Edward E.O. Wilson, uh, primarily. Um, he's a guy who's originally from Alabama, but he's moved on to other parts. He's, uh, he studies ants. He does insects. Uh, he t teaches at Harvard right now. Uh, prolific writer. Um, Dr. Sarah Parkak, who I actually took classes from, the space archaeologist. She's a, I, I find her to be very, very cool, very fascinating. I love the way she puts the projects together. Now um, she's the lady that I remember that uses the satellite imagery to uh, 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 investigate or maybe find new UNESCO sites and some things of that nature. Is that who I'm remembering? That's right. Who, yeah, that's right. Satellite archaeologist. Yeah. That what a, what a great job. Yeah, for real. And you know, I've seen her uh, teach classes and work in a lab, and like she's she really loves what she's doing. She's really cutting a new edge in the field, and uh, you could see it. She's also childlike in the way she approaches her topics. Yeah, I've heard a couple of her interviews. Uh, very fascinating. Uh, I'm trying to remember, she was uh, recently talking about, maybe it's a couple of years ago, it might be a little bit later now, where they were uh, using the imagery of, uh, it's at, I think it's at uh, uh, National Park in, in Iowa, where the... Uh, Indian burial grounds are. I'm trying to remember the name of that particular park. And she was instrumental in discovering uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, theft of some of the uh, uh, artifacts. 
Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, she's been helping with the looting in Egypt, too, after their more recent civil civil troubles. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the prospect of the tool to preserve archaeology, uh, especially, but her ability to find new sites is incredible. Like, the stuff she's found in Egypt alone has just been mind-blowing, the scale right. of it. Exactly. Well, if there's somebody that would be maybe a... Somebody that I find as fascinating as maybe Jacques Cousteau, uh, she's right up there in that realm of she's a great scientist, but she seems to be a very good science communicator. Uh, yeah, she is. She is. And she's all about uh, getting the message out because there's a ticking clock on a lot of the archaeology around the world. The looting has gotten to rampant levels in places, and in some places, like North America, people don't even realize we have archaeology. Uh, you know, we idolize Egypt and Rome and, and, and places like that, but we have cities thousands of year, years old sitting right here in our backyard, and they've either been looted, bulldozed for, you know, shopping development, or people don't realize what they have. And uh, her new tools, the satellite archaeology tools, ha can do a lot to really change that paradigm. Well, I think it's the documentation that is is so important in her work. And I would venture to say that you're kind of uh, at, the, at the beginning of your own career, and you will find your own tools to uh, uh, contribute to that, uh, that cause. Uh, it might be through your filmmaking that you uh, find your niche, uh, but it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting journey, Kyle, to watch you uh, progress. Um, you know, the thing that I was uh, also curious about as I was preparing for this uh, uh, conversation today was... Your uh, YouTube channel, Trexpertise. Right. And that was, that was a deep dive into science fiction as it relates to the real world and real life. Can you tell me what inspired you to even do such a thing? What, what possessed you, man, to try to connect Klingons with uh, real life? Uh, Crisco. Uh, uh, the, the, the vegetable shortening. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, well done, sir. <clears throat> here's how, uh, anthropology and I guess history a little bit more anthropology works, right? So you, you want to study a bunch of different things about what people do and what they mean and how they intersect with the way the world is functioning. Um, but sometimes the scope of what you can look at is very small, but it turns out a lot of the details that you're looking for come right out of the smallest thing of study. Uh, I attended this graduate student lecture on Crisco, uh, artificial shortening versus traditional animal fat for cooking. And uh, I thought, great, you know, I was, I was getting extra points for being there and uh, this is going to be boring. It's, you know, it's not even really about food culture. It's about something you use to cook food. Um, but it was utterly fascinating. There, there were so many... Uh, insights into the history of American food and, and, and into what people eat in, in terms of poverty versus uh, wealth um, in different, you know, racial subclasses, you know, how African Americans use, uh, you know, fat to cook and, and, and the wars, the commercial wars that popped up between vegetable uh, shortening and, and animal fat. And it, it just... Like, you, you could pry open an entire quadrant of a diary of the, of the history of the United States by looking at Crisco, vegetable shortening, uh, and, and how people cook things like that. And I thought, you know, this is exactly what defines this discipline. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more you could do that, obviously, with the works of fiction that people create. And, you know, Star Trek's been studied a lot um, in terms of like its impact on society, but I got the sense that people were only talking about the same things over and over. And uh, so I wanted to see, I wanted to crack open and see what was the Crisco in, in, in this scenario that we could use to find something new to talk about with Star Trek. Is there any meaning that we've missed? Is there any like any accidental things that, you know, all these different writers had put into the show that, maybe people hadn't considered before. And that's sort of the impetus behind the channel. Well, you know, clearly you've had an impact with almost 4 million views and 63,000 subscribers. 
Um, and certainly you've sucked me in really quickly because you, you have brought a new perspective and I don't think you're just in an echo chamber with the way you're kind of approaching your production. It's witty, it's funny, but you also evoke deep thoughts and things for me to reflect upon. And there was a couple of the, uh, uh, episodes in particular, I wanted to talk to you about one of them was when you interviewed, the man that uh, wrote the Star Trek animated episode, The Serpent's Tooth. Can you remind me again who this man was and, or who he is and why you wanted to talk to him and talk to him about Star Trek and his involvement all those many years ago, the 1970s? Uh, Russell Bates. Um, yeah. Is he, the writer's name is Russell Bates. He was a co-writer on the episode, I think, kind of the lead writer, but it it was a co-situation. And um, he's a Kiowa man, Kiowa being a nation of people of the mid to lower Great Plains, um, kind of next to the Apaches on the cultural spectrum. And um, he reached out to me. The first episode of Trexpertise I did was this long 20-minute, you know, nonsensical, I mean, thing about, you know, what... Native Americans showed up in Star Trek. Like, what was that like? What were they saying? Like, just to sort of examine everything Native America. And after a couple of months, he reached out to me. He's like, hey, man, uh, I think you got some details wrong. Because uh, apparently I'd taken a, a, what he thought was a maybe a cheap shot at the episode he wrote. So he, you know, he messaged me. He gave me his phone number, told, told me to call him. I called him. We had a couple of long conversations about uh, his involvement with Star Trek. And it apparently it went really, really, uh, deep. Like he, um, you know, he got pulled into the show by writing a spec script, which doesn't happen anymore. And, uh, a friend of a friend of a friend situation showed the script to a producer of the show and he got pulled in for the third season, which never materialized. And then he got called back for the animated series. Like it's sort of a really wonderful story how he got connected to it all. And he just, he thought, he wanted to set some of the records straight, and I was very interested in talking to him because how many Native American Star Trek writers do you get the chance to speak to? So Probably not. The interview we did, uh, I flew out to Oklahoma to visit him at his home. He's a very nice guy, uh, very knowledgeable, lots of stories about uh, that era of Hollywood and about Gene Roddenberry and, and all the people involved in the original series. And, uh, you know, he had a lot to say. So that's sort of where that episode came from. And uh, actually, of all the episodes on the channel so far, I think that might be my favorite. Well, I'll, I will tell you, of all the Star Trek animated episodes, that was the one that I still remembered because it had a dive into uh, the uh, early civilizations of America. I mean, that was such a deep thing. For a Saturday morning cartoon, I don't even, you know, I thought Johnny Quest was cool, but this was way cool. Mm, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I really was blown away by that, even as a kid. And when I saw that you had done that, I was like, oh, Kyle and me are like kindred spirits. because this, <laughs> this was so awesome, man. So I'm, I was so happy that you revealed such an interesting backstory. And I'm really pleased to hear that it's one of your favorites because it is one of mine as well. So, you know, one of the things, one of the other ones that I wanted to talk to you about was the one that I just watched, uh, and I have a, a number of questions that I have and uh, one of my very good friends have, is the one that you did about epic Trek, talking about uh, the, the myths of our past in Western civilization, whether it's Greek or Roman stories like Homer or the Aeneid, and I found that that one was fascinating in how you kind of connected the dots uh, between modern stories of of uh, our culture and these, uh, it was almost like I was thinking about my Joseph Campbell uh, uh, era in my life, where I would read his books and watch his uh, his films, discussing the the man uh, the the man of a thousand faces. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me about the the thought process in creating that particular episode, Epic Trek. Um, so <clears throat> my, my wife and I, we work as a team, um, and she's more the writer than I am by miles. Um, but we had been talking about this, uh, idea 
uh, behind science fiction that the, the reason we both like science fiction independently and bonded over some sci-fi love was that we felt it was sort of a conversation about what's going on. You know, if you're going to talk about clones or if you're going to talk about the robot uprising or uh, things of this nature that you find in science fiction, you're not going to do it under the guise of a romantic comedy. You know, you're not going to do it typically, uh, unless you're very creative, uh, under a more domestic uh, situation or a a historical period piece. You know, you usually go to the future in the perspectives you take. uh, We found naturally parallel to, you know, the sort of high stakes uh, view that epic poetry and state-sponsored epic poetry and, and stories from the ancients of the old world, you know, it, to, to us, to our eye, it was the same uh, sort of vantage point that they were speaking from, it, minus the fourth dimension. Sci-fi is different in that way. And so we just investigated it, talked about it, and, um, you know, it just clicked really well. Uh, Katie, my wife, is a, a, also a professor, and she ends up teaching the Odyssey uh, every other semester or so. And, you know, we just saw the parallels and spelled it out. And we gave it a test go as a lecture for the Miami Science Fiction, the International Miami Science Fiction Film Festival. Uh, I think I got the, the wording wrong on the official title of that, of that film festival in Miami. And, uh, you know, the ideas clicked really well. So we put it on the back burner and decided to turn it into a Trek Expertise episode. Do you often road test the ideas like that before you uh, create a, uh, a, a short film? Or was that a unique circumstance where you had uh, a lecture developed between yourself and Katie and you uh, uh, developed it in that fashion? Um, it was a little unique. Usually we just write and talk to each other and, you know, maybe do the research independently and... Uh, you know, from the comfort of our own home, uh, rarely do I get in front of a crowd and speak. It, it's really tough for me to do that. Um, but more, uh, the reasoning for the initial lecture wasn't to create an episode. It was really to um, uh, to sort of explain to an audience who'd never heard of Czech expertise what we're kind of doing and why sci-fi has a particular importance in our culture. And, you know, it made sense to 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 link it to the ideas that we were developing about how it's connected to you know, the Odyssey. Oh, yeah. I mean, I found it fascinating uh, when you started, uh, you know, making these uh, 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 comparison and contrasts between these very old stories that are, you know, stories that are verbal, you know, uh, oral histories or at least oral stories and comparing it with, with, which, with something that is more permanent, at least for a while, films. Uh because films are kind of like you know an, a, a snapshot of somebody's vision that takes years to put together, whereas you know oral histories develop over uh, generations because they're passed from one storyteller to another. Not on. Well, I, I'm limiting my discussion maybe here with uh, you know the cradle of Western civilization, but to uh, to at least keep in the back of our minds the the Native American cultures, which have their own stories, and a lot of, a lot of them we don't know mm-hmm. because we're not a part of that uh, that culture, and a lot of that is uh, uh, somewhat, uh, uh, it's been lost to us because of the uh, genocide of, of the Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's difficult to, to know that all those possible stories are lost in the midst of time, but there's a lot of that all over the world. Uh, the stories that we have, like Gilgamesh, for example, it's amazing that we were able to see a glimpse of that story, considering how old it is. And I don't know, the, Joseph Campbell hit on uh, a very fundamental truth about the universal nature of some of these stories, uh, which is related to their function. Like, And, you know, it was impossible to think that sci-fi wasn't doing the same thing. It's touching on a kind of anxiety that we have uh, and identifying the anxiety as something that's always kind of been there uh, was really the only real work of, you know, that you had to do with that, with that whole idea. Well, you know, you've, you've touched on a real interesting point, but when you were uh, really starting to get into the meat of, Trek expertise in developing these ideas 
uh, whether it's about artificial inte- intelligence or feminism or uh, simply discussing uh, the uh, actual scientific basis for something like the alien uh, creatures in, in that franchise, does the recent trip to Antarctica, has it transformed your appreciation for these stories? Because I'm sure that was always in the back of your mind as you were looking at these settlements where these uh, art, uh, these uh, explorers of the South Pole that they created these base camps and never returned. Are you, uh, are, were you completely uh, 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 brought uh, let, me re- let me rephrase this. Do you have a new appreciation for these myths and stories because of that trip to Antarctica? That's what I want to say. Um, not, not really. Uh, a new appreciation. I mean, an appreciation. Yes. I'm not sure that uh, the experience in Antarctica, Antarctica, really changed how I felt about these old stories. Um. If anything, it just added to the tapestry of how I saw or how I see reality already. Like, it just added more information in places that I didn't think I had, even in regards to, like, what the ancient Greeks thought. Um, because, you know, we're all kind of on in the same predicament. Each time a human is born in every era, you know, you, you're born into a culture, and between your wits and the, and the knowledge the culture passes on to you, you don't really know much about the world, and... The fact that we know so much right now is a, a real gift, and being able to go to a place like Antarctica, a technologically infused adventure, wouldn't have been possible for ancient peoples, and that was foremost on my mind. You know, I would think about, you know, what would the Mexica do with this, um, you know, kind of vantage point at the bottom of the planet? Would they even realize, uh, you know, what what they were seeing in terms of where? I mean, I don't know. It contextualizes you so hard being out in the world into a place like that. Uh, but specifically, did it change or add to an appreciation for the ancient stories of the world? I don't think so, except maybe to say, you know, they didn't have all the information, and we have a lot more than they did, and I'm, I feel really blessed to, uh, to have that vantage point. To, to be able to have a vantage point like that is incredible. Uh, absolutely. I can only imagine how that has impacted you. Did, did that uh, trip to Antarctica, has it changed your lifestyle in Alabama and in, you know, kind of a first world nation like the United States? Did it make you hyper aware of, say, the uh, debate of uh, climate change or uh, biodiversity? Uh, did it I'm sure it did in some way, but can you maybe expand on what that might have been for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I mean, like most people in the 21st century connected to the Internet, I know what climate change is. I understand the science behind it. I um, am concerned about it. Uh, the concern I had before Antarctica was abstract. You know, people said recycle. Uh, vote for candidates that, you know, will do something about the problem. I did those things. I still do those things. Um, But it never connected. And even though I saw on the news about, you know, some of these weather changes that are happening, more rain, more flooding, things of that nature, um, you know, you could see it happening in the world. But, you know, Alabama is a very comfortable place to live. Uh, There's not a lot of people here. The cities are just the right size if you, if you, you know, want to relax and be ambitious. Um, you just, it just doesn't hit hard here. You're in a bubble here in the first world. Antarctica totally changed that. It made the ideas behind climate change absolutely visceral. Um, there was a moment in the Edmondson Sea, which I didn't know anything about. Uh, and a lot of the people on the ship, because this trip was so special and so remote, a lot of the people on the ship had been to Antarctica before, and uh, they were go- going on this trip because they were going to places that normally you can't get to. And, you know, we were in the Edmondson Sea area, and it started to rain and uh, below the Antarctic Circle. And Sounds uh, like it was unheard of. It is pretty rare. 
And uh, I was getting information from people on the boat, some of which were scientists, some of which were journalists who had been down there before. And, you know, they hadn't seen quite seen anything like that. And, you know, it, it's Antarctica is a desert. It's literally the driest continent on the planet. And any kind of moisture that winds up in the atmosphere freezes out instantly and, you know, comes down to snow, if anything. But it it's so dry there. It rarely snows. I mean, it, you think all that ice would be, you know, like a snow haven, but like precipitation is is in a desert is really rare. And Antarctica is the desert of deserts. And um, we were traveling through the Edmonton Sea and seeing rain. I've got pictures of rain on the windows of the ship, and you know, it it was really brought home to me. Like, holy crap! <laughs> it's such. A, not only am I getting to see this really amazing part of the world, but I. I mean, I believe we're getting to see the changes firsthand. Uh, Antarctica and North, the North Pole are like canaries in the coal mine. And I got to see the canary kick a little bit. And uh, now that I'm back home, it's, um, you know, make sure you recycle all your things. <laughs> make sure you vote for the candidates that you can. Um, it, it really made it a visceral thing to understand climate change. And I, I didn't realize I was missing that. Well... You know, until this moment, I never thought of Antarctica as a desert. Mm-hmm. You know, I had I had the the Hollywood version of what Antarctica was, which was kind of maybe more like the way the explorers that climbed Everest. You know, I thought of it more like that. But what you said really makes sense to me because that continent has been in that state for millions of years and now in our lifetime it is beginning to change it's horrifying Mm -hmm. yeah it's moving they're uh moving populations of animals around uh they're trying to adapt uh for example uh gen 2 penguins uh little uh, little penguins that have like a white strap on top of their head like a little white saddle on top of their head uh we went to the ukrainian base uh to visit one day, and they're besieged by, I think it's Gentoo penguins, um, uh, all over their front door, and that is a recent change, and people were thinking that they're, you know, moving in accordance with uh, the area of weather that they find most comfortable, and it's only in the last couple of years that they showed up, like, covering the Ukrainian base, and, like, when you step out the front door at the Ukrainian base, there are penguins everywhere. They have a bar there. Uh, where they made vodka, and the ship's occupants went ashore, had a couple of shots, went outside, watched the penguins goof off. It, it it was really cool, but, you know, normally those penguins aren't there, from what I understand. And uh, there are populations of, of uh, species moving around as a result right now, and maybe we saw some of that while we were on our trip. And just really brings it home. I, I can only imagine that uh, that was just another one of those memorable moments that truly had an impact uh, in your in your uh, 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 worldview. So I guess um, I want to talk briefly as we wrap this up today, uh, Kyle. And thank you so much. Your your conversation with me is so inspiring. I want to thank you very much uh, sure. for what what you're uh, uh, bringing to the my audience today. So tell me about your new venture, uh, Screen Door Pictures and what you want to do uh, with uh, this uh, new idea of yours uh, with you and your wife. Uh, Screen Door Pictures is a uh, motion picture company. We intend to do feature-length films, especially of a sci-fi nature, um, and that's the, uh, that's our career goal. And uh, sure, it starts small, and sure, I'm on YouTube, but truth is, I like YouTube. It's a wonderful place for experimentation, and it's a really crazy place uh, to try new ideas. And um, overall, though, we're we're film people, and that's uh, that's exactly what we intend to do. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I can't wait to see some of your uh, uh, projects come to the big screen, and uh, can't wait to see them at uh, Cannes and uh, Sundance and uh, all of these uh, uh, venues that are hungry for ideas from filmmakers such as uh, uh, you and Katie. Um, you know, Kyle, we could just keep this going for uh, hours on hours, but uh, 
what I'd like to do is, and maybe the next time we do this, that maybe I can talk to you and your wife uh, again, maybe in a couple years after we see a couple of your films come to the come to life, and we can talk about that again. Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, this is Kyle Sullivan, and uh, he is going to be a force of nature with uh, all his uh, fellow uh, filmmakers. So. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thanks for talking to me today. Thank you for having me. could have talked to Kyle for a couple hours. Kyle Sullivan's interview has captured perfectly what my vision of what the silent pianist show is supposed to be about. Curious people doing extraordinary things. Well, I think a trip to Antarctica by winning a worldwide contest qualifies as doing extraordinary things. You can find more information about Kyle's journey to Antarctica at the Oceanwide Expeditions website. Just look below in the description to find that link. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel Trexpertise and his personal YouTube channel Kyle Sullivan to view his Adventures in the Southland films. Just search for Kyle Sullivan at YouTube and you can see all his wonderful films and innovative film creations. And for those of you viewing this podcast at YouTube, all the visuals produced are by filmmakers Kyle Sullivan and Katie Boyer. My name is Mike Dawson, and I am the silent pianist. You can find me at my band's website, RoarElectra.com or at my Twitter at Mike Dawson Music. And you can find the Silent Pianist podcast anywhere podcasts are found. Goodbye, old friends. I am the Silent Pianist. See you next time. Mm-hmm.